Hello everyone, um, welcome to the VIA medical webinar on the use of NIV for patients with acute respiratory failure. Um, my name is Graham McCourt and I am the Global KL Manager for Adult Ventilation for VIA Medical. Today's lecture will be given by Professor Stefano Nava from Bologna, Italy. Um, he's the household name with regards to the use of NIV for patients with acute respiratory failure. Um, his major fields of interest include mechanical ventilation, weaning, respiratory muscle, and ethics. And he has developed the use of NIV as a weaning technique. He has published over 261 peer review journals, uh, papers and journals. So as you can see, um, he is the expert on this topic. Um, please, before we start, don't forget to invite um, or have any questions at all through the chat box. Um, and we'll try this at the very end. So uh, Stefano, please give us a nice lecture. Thank you. So can you see my slide? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Graham. Uh, you always uh, pronounce my name uh, very badly because I'm Stefano, not Stefano. Anyhow, I taught you several times. No, I'm joking. So thank you, Graham, for the invitation. Thanks to all of you joining us for the webinar. Well, uh, I'm going to talk about, as Graham said, about the use of non-invasive ventilation in acute respiratory failure. And I will deal mainly uh, with uh, relatively recent uh, European Respiratory Society, American Thoracic Society task force on this topic. Well, these are my conflict of interest. So let's start with the aims of this uh, uh, 45 minute lecture. Uh, objective number one, uh, how the task force was conducted because I think it's interesting for all of us to understand how a specific paper has been conducted because sometimes uh, uh, we receive tons of papers, tons of sentences, and we do not really understand how they were uh, built up. The second objective is uh, about the clinical guideline themselves, what's new and what's uh, different comparing to the old guidelines. And then I will deal a whole section on controversial issues because I think they are uh, very important for a clinical point of view. Well, how the task force was conducted? Well, that was uh, a, a quite long process. Uh, we put together uh, a, a group of people, so-called expert, if you trust the word expert in the field, and members of the steering committee were those highlighted in uh, um, red. And each uh, society uh, gave uh, three members and the task force was conducted by uh, Bram Rochberg, that is an ICU physician uh, that is mainly a methodologist. And Bram opened to us a old world that we didn't know uh, before. Well, the first question that I pose when we join together is, do we need guidelines? Do we need an evidence-based medicine process? Uh, we know our daily clinical practice. We know our job. Do we need someone else telling us what should and what we should not do? Well, it ended up that I think that the meaning of every guidelines is probably to minimize the bias of the large variability in dealing with similar issue. This pertains medicine, but not only medicine. And I will start with this uh, example. This is winning. Uh, most of you, when uh, hear the word winning, they refer to winning from mechanical ventilation. But as a matter of fact, WINIS is also another more, I would say, sophisticated and uh, delicate words. WINIS is what Rubens 
described in a very classical way, right? Everyone rec can recognize the baby, the mother, the breast. Later on, Trisha Klein, uh, she paint winning according to a different view. You can still recognize, however, baby, mother, and breast, obviously, in a different manner. Last but not least, Diego Rivera from Mexico, the former companion of Frida Kahlo, painted the winning process in this way. Well, this is more, I would say, difficult to pick up. Uh, you can barely recognize maybe the mother, I don't know, maybe the baby for sure, not the breast. So we need to avoid in medicines this confusion in defining, in treating, whatever you want to call a disease of a condition. Well, the meaning of the ERS ATS task force was to provide focus recommendation of the use of NIV in acute respiratory failure, obviously. As I said, this was uh, an international panel of content expert uh, committed to comprehensive application of great methods for the development of this task force. And uh, there is also an online supplement that I invite to you to eventually read for a uh, matter of time, I cannot deal with this, provide technical summary on interfacing, setting, and monitoring. When you develop a task force, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but uh, as I said that since the beginning, we need to understand how we were working. We need to develop what we call the PICO question. PICO stands for population, intervention, comparison, and outcome. And we rank each of these question, each of these different items to be critical, important, or not important. Then we did a systematic review and the methodologist did for us, but we were not very good in that, an evidence profile. That means a pool estimate of effect for each outcome and a quality of evidence for each outcomes. And we rank it the uh, quality of study according to the a EBM criteria, like high, moderate, low, and very low. You know better than I do, randomized control trials, uh, observational trial, et cetera, et cetera. And then all this material came back to the guideline panel that we joined together three or four times. And finally, we formulate recommendation. I will come back once more on what we mean for recommendation. But first, I want to start with the easiest case, the case of the application of NIV in acute respiratory failure due to COPD exacerbation. You can call, conversely, acute hypercapnic respiratory failure. Well, this is what the methodologies did for us. Three different subgroups of people uh, from the top to bottom, the studies dealing with NIV versus standard medical care here. Obviously, this is the overall effect, statistically significant. Second group, only two studies, face-to-face -face comparison between NIV and mechanical ventilation, that means endotracheal intubation. No difference in the main outcome that was mortality. And then a third subset of patient or studies better, patient with acute respiratory failure who are not acidotic. Well, once more, no major difference between NIV and standard medical treatment. How much can we trust the evidence that this plot suggested to us? Well, first of all, you need to consider the number of study, obviously of randomized control style, the risk of biases in this respect, the risk was not serious, 
inconsistency, indirectness, imprecision, they were all not serious biases. The number of patients in a row, the effect, the relatives, and the absolute effect, and the quality of paper. Quality in this field, COPD exacerbation was very high, and the importance was critical. Well, from evidence to recommendation, this is what we got from a great point of view. How should we translate this in clinical practice from evidence to recommendation? Well, we decide according to this criteria to use two different terminology. We recommend or we suggest. Well, they have very different meaning. When we state in the guidelines, we recommend, this means strong recommendation. You cannot follow this recommendation. However, be sure that you know why not. For example, if you can't ventilate one night a COPD patient using non-invasive ventilation because you do not have any interface, well, you need to sign on a paper. NIV was indicated, but I didn't got in my hospital any interface, or the patient refused it, or the patient uh, got a lot of secretion, whatever. But you need to explain why you did not follow a recommendation. Different meaning, less strong for sure, is the word we suggest. Recommendation is weaker. If someone decides differently, do not be dogmatic. So we need to apply all these guidelines all over the world. Here, you don't need to think about a high quality hospital, a very well-trained staff, a very rich country. These guidelines should be applied everywhere. So we need to be very balanced, very serious, and quite conservative sometimes. So coming back to the clinical part, and I promise to you that we never come back once more to the methodology. So the first recommendation was the following. We recommend strong, eh? that bi-level NIV for patients with acute respiratory failure leading to acute or acute on chronic respiratory acidosis with mean pH less than 7.35 due to COPD exacerbation. There is something new from the previous guidelines. The previous guidelines, the ATS guidelines, dated the year 2000, so 21 years ago. There were not studies comparing NIV versus intubation. We consider in these guidelines also two studies about the comparison between these two techniques. And we ended up to recommend always a trial of bilevel NIV in patients considered to require endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation unless the patient is immediately deteriorating. So if a patient is gasping from here, is on respiratory arrest, there is no doubt that you need to intubate the patient. But even if the patient is very severely acidotic or very severely hypercapnic, why don't you try? Last, but still is new compared to the old guidelines, prophylaxis in COPD exacerbation. We suggest that NIV should not be used in patients with hypercapnia who are not acidotic in the setting once more of COPD exacerbation. So the two studies show no benefits of applying NIV compared to standard medical treatment in patients not yet acidotic. Slum drugs. Strong recommendation for initiation from these guidelines. The same old story, acute exacerbation of COPD, we talk about that, 
cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Well, this is well established. So the strong recommendation, according to the guidelines, were uh, according to these two kinds of diseases or conditions. What's new versus the old guidelines? First of all, I found this topic extremely interesting. The pre-hospital application of non-invasive ventilation in the pre-hospital setting of cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Well, it was quite surprising to me to see that there were at least six randomized controlled trials about the use of any former non-invasive support, including CPAP or better NIV, in the ambulance or directly at the home of the patient. And we ended up to suggest that CPAP of bilevel NIV should be used for patients with acute respiratory failure to cardiogenic pulmonary edema in the pre-hospital settings. However, due to the study design, uh, we decide to suggest the use of this device outside the hospital and not to recommend. Then we put together a sort of other condition. Interestingly enough, on the right hand side, we clearly evidentiate conditional recommendation against the use of NIV in pox extubation of respiratory failure. Conditional recommendation for at least six or seven other kind of condition. No recommendation, we will come back later. Now we're going to deal about conditional recommendation. And once more, what's new compared to the old guidelines? Well, let's start with palliative care associated dyspnea. Why I start with palliative care? Because I will show in the next two slides what was concluded in the very, very recent American Association uh, of uh, Oncologists statement about the treatment of dyspnea in end-stage cancer patients. Well, according to the literature that we can gather uh, during this uh, uh, task force process, we ended up to figure out that non-invasive ventilation improved compared to oxygen dyspnea, namely lowered birth scale by 0.89 points, decreased opioids requirement of about 30 milligram uh, of morphine equivalent. And therefore, we suggest, once more we suggest and not recommend offering NIV to this PNAIC patient for palliation in the setting or terminal cancer or other terminal condition. Can be COPD, can be post-surgical patient, can be restricted to ratchet disorder, including amyotrophy lateral sclerosis, for example. I was mentioning this document is still online. I got the chance to participate to this interest in task force and dealing only with oncologists and palliativists, not pulmonologists. That was an also an interesting uh, issue. ASCO guidelines about the management of dyspnea in this patient. Recommendation, a time-limited, obviously, therapeutical trial of NIV, if available, may be offered to patients who have significant dyspnea despite standard measure and do not have contraindication. So the strength of recommendation was moderate and the evidence quality was low, mainly because there are only a couple of studies dealing with this topic. But these recommendations were very similar with what we decided in the task force. And I'm happy that also that the American Association of Clinical Oncology come out, came out with a recommendation very similar to what we did. 
Another kind of disease where the condition, uh, the recommendation is conditional, chest trauma or lung contusion. Well, four studies, I mean, once more randomized control trial. Well, the risk of bias, as you can see here, was serious in uh, uh, most of the outcomes, for sure not on mortality, because you are alive or you're dead, so you don't have a risk of bias. But concerning the intubation criteria, the ICU loss of stay, of occurrence of nosocomial pneumonia, uh, the bias was serious. Uh, inconsistency was not serious, uh, but uh, and the quality overall was moderate to low. So the relative risk for mortality uh, was 0.55, so it was pretty impressive. But we need to recognize that all these study, as I said before, have some problems in their design. First of all, population was very often heterogeneous. The severity of illness was different. The definition of chest trauma was different. Rib versus flayed chest, pulmonary contusion, other form of injuries, and then the most important bias, various comparators. Remember PICO, eh? remember PICO, C means comparators. Well, here it was a sort of misstep. Some studies compare NIV versus standard oxygen, some other study versus invasive ventilation. So everything was a little bit confusing. So we ended up to suggest NIV for chest trauma in this patient, but the recommendation was once more conditional and with a moderate certain on evidence. Postoperative respiratory failure. Well, once more, there are tons of studies, but the risk of bias once more is pretty high. I didn't want to mention all the studies and the funnel plot because it's a mess, really. A lot of studies. Abdominal surgery, thoracic surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, and among abdominal surgery, upper and lower. CPAP versus NIV. Different comparator, standard oxygen, high flow nasal cannula, and uh, rain intubation. Surgical complication, such as anastomotic leak or intra abdominal sepsis should be addressed first before taking a firm recommendation. So what we did once more is yes, we suggest, but the recommendation was still conditional with a modern inserting of evidence. Here is a study just to show you how difficult it is to take a recommendation. This is a very well published study by Stefan and co-worker on JAMA 2015. High flow nasal oxygen versus non-invasive uh, uh, positive pressure ventilation in hypoxic patient after cardiothoracic surgery. That trial was a non-inferiority trial, a randomized control one. As you can see here, no difference in uh, uh, the treatment failure between reintubation or mortality at day seven after extubation compared the two uh, devices. However, you may claim that Eye flow is a sort of respiratory support. Uh, in a certain sense, I could be partially agree. For sure, standard oxygen is not. So here you are not comparing uh, what we call before the standard of care that was oxygen until a few years ago. So once more to tell you how difficult sometimes is to draw firm recommendation from this different study with different outcomes and different comparators. Prophylaxis, impoxic tubation, respiratory failure in high risk patient. Well, uh, once more, uh, in, there are studies, uh, and we found inconsistencies regarding the criteria for considering patient at high risk. Some paper consider all the patient being intubated, some other only patient with hypercapnia, some other patient with at least two comorbidities, some other with old age. So 
at the end of the day, you may finish to compare apple and oranges. And once more, the comparator was different. Patient with an unplanned extubation are a higher risk group. And first a study for sure should be specifically addressed to the use of NIV in this specific subset of patients. However, coming back to prevention of respiratory failure in the post-extubation period, once more, we suggest, but not recommend the use of NIV. Controversial issue. Well, this is the last part, and I spent a little bit of more time probably because I found these issues quite hot topics. But first, I'm not going to deal with asthma exacerbation, mainly because there is no single study dealing with asthma exacerbation and acute respiratory failure. So I will deal here only about pandemics and de novo respiratory failure. Well, as you know, unfortunately, pandemics is more than a hot topic, hopefully was more than a hot topic. At least here in Italy, the third wave is fading down slowly, but it's fading down. But still it's 16 months that we face this problem. And the guidelines were obviously written before the COVID-19 outbreak. Well, at the time of these uh, guidelines, only observational studies could be found in the literature. And most of them were dealing with a single outcome. But it's quite important, that is mortality. Here is uh, the funder plot of a very few study published in the literature at that time of the guidelines. Please note that despite no randomized control trial was performed, there was already an heterogeneity of disease. SARS, I mean the former SARS, not SARS-CoV, and the viral H1N1. And in most of the case, well, if you draw some, uh, I would say, can be dangerous conclusion, you may see from this plot a trend for NIV to be superior to oxygen treatment. But we didn't want to take obviously any recommendation about this because there were not randomized control trial, heterogeneous group of patients, low event number with a lot of imprecision. And then there was at that time, the big question mark, is the use of NIV during pandemics dangerous? I think now we agree, I think, maybe not, but I think at least here in Europe, but even in the US, and in China, obviously, in the Far East, NIV has been largely used during COVID-19 infection. Well, as you know, Italy was the first Western country that faced early uh, February 2020 the pandemics coming from China. We need to put together a bunch of people working outside the ICU. I have an ICU also, but most of my colleagues, uh, pulmonologists, they work outside the ICU. We need to put together what we call an early consensus management for non-ICU treatment of acute respiratory failure during uh, 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 COVID-19 infection. When early March, we published this flowchart in which for the first time probably, we suggest the use in patient not responded 
to oxygen therapy, the use of CPAP or an IV. Well, you may say you were crazy at that point in time. Maybe, but you need to face that early February 2020, the ICU beds, the negative pressure room were gone like this. In one day, all the hospital had the ICU beds and the negative pressure room occupied by patients with acute respiratory failure. I show you a couple of papers. The first one is from uh, the Lombardia group. Uh, in the first three weeks of outbreaks, well, they admit almost 9,000 patients in that large Italian region, actually the largest. And around 800 of these patients were treated with uh, NIV outside the ICU. Success rate was pretty high, considering, considering that the environment was not the best one. The people applying NIV, in most of the case, were not very well trained because all the pulmonologists can, and the intensivists can deal with a X amount of patients. But all the other patients coming to the hospital as a terrible wave, they could be treated by uh, internists, uh, even neurologists, gastroenterologists, whatever. So the success rate was pretty high, 500 out of 800 people. Well, this is the probably uh, the more, uh, not because we did, but probably a more informative study uh, performed with non-invasive uh, support, including high flow nasal cannula outside the ICU in, uh, in uh, north part of Italy uh, in the first uh, three months of pandemics. Uh, almost 700 people. Uh, here is the PF ratio. PF ratio was pretty low, 152. Uh, obviously, uh, the largest use was for uh, Elmet CPAP because at that point in time, it was the easy uh, support uh, to apply. And the Elmet, we thought, uh, prevented uh, contamination of the environment. But looking at NIV on the right hand side, uh, the mean PF was even lower than in the other, uh, with the other technique, 138. Uh, we treat 177 patients. Uh, that means that 26% of the total of patients needing respiratory support outside the ICU. Uh, in this subgroup of patients, and the trachea rate was 31%, the mortality rate was 29. So I think not bad at all. Uh, but I have to admit that all these uh, data were collected in the respiratory unit. So with people skill in the application of, uh, of NIV, including uh, all the kind of clinician, nurses, doctors, respiratory therapists. Well, this to give you an idea about the difference between the first and the second wave of pandemics, uh, here in Italy, I want just to draw your attention on the last line. Uh, the NIV use increased from 18% during the first wave uh, up, up to 28% together with high flow nasal cannula, while the use of CPAP uh, was, uh, I would say, significantly decreased. Well, last point I want to deal with, de novo respiratory failure. What hell is de novo respiratory failure? Well, we use this terminology because it's different from uh, IRDS, for example. De novo respiratory failure refers to respiratory failure of any origin occurring without prior chronic respiratory disease. Obviously, patients in this category have hypoxic respiratory failure. That means uh, a PF ratio lower than 200 tachypnea, respiratory rate higher than 30, 35 breaths per minute, and obviously non-COPD diagnosis by definition. The Berlin document, when uh, tackled the treatment for uh, 
I would say IRDS patient that may be including the novel respiratory failure, they suggest that NIV should be used basically not in the novel respiratory failure because they said there is a space eventually between 200 and 300 of uh, uh, here, 200 and 300 of PF ratio. But the novel respiratory failure by definition is below this limit. Well, let's see what happened in real life. Interesting study by Giacomo Bellani and co-workers inside the Lancet study, you know, for sure, the Lancet study published on JAMA. And this was a subgroup analysis on patient uh, with acute uh, respiratory distress syndrome and ventilated with NIV. Well, if you follow what the Berlin definition suggested, you should have used NIV only in mild IRDS from 200 to 300 that once upon a time was called acute lung injury. Using this subset of people, 17%, IRDS moderate between 200 and under 21%, severe RDS 15%. So there was no clear following or recommendation. There was a, I would say, pretty homogeneous distribution of around 18% of use of NIV in IRDS patient is respecting of the severity. But severity also determine the success or failure of NIV. And if you apply obviously in severe IRDS patient, more than half of these patients, they are going to fail NIV. And this is not obviously the case in mild IRDS. Moderate, but no less, is exactly the same like severe. Well, you will see that the recommendation suggests eventually a short trial of NIV in IRDS patient and obviously on the novo respiratory thing. But please, not intubate, do not delay the time of intubation in this patient. In other words, not too late. This is a real story. This is a, an Italian marathon uh, uh, athlete, Dorando Petri, in Los Angeles uh, Olympics, back at the beginning of, this, of the last century. This guy arrived first, and then he just collapsed before the finish line, and these two guys, they helped him to pass the finish line. And the poor Dorando Petri was disqualified. So never been too late. Delayed intubation, as a matter of fact, increased mortality in the novo respiratory failure. Well, this is a paper from a Spanish group of Antonio Torres, non-invasive ventilation in community acquired pneumonia and severe acute respiratory failure. And you see here, patient alive, they're eventually intubated pretty early. The duration of NIV was around 24 hours, one day, not more, even too much probably. Patient instead who died, they got the application on NIV to a prolonged period of time, three fourths day. So you need to be careful. If you want to apply NIV in this subset of patients with hypoxic respiratory failure, please be very conscious and do not delay the time of intubation. You always need to keep in mind one thing, the importance of transpulmonary pressure. Where transpulmonary pressure to make things easy is the difference between, uh, that then is the sum because pleural pressure is negative, of the pressure apply, that you apply on the vent and the patient the, and, and the patient is developed in, with the inspiratory mask. So in mild de novo acute respiratory failure, when you apply, for example, a pressure of 20 with a ventilator, it is quite likely that you develop a pressure of minus five with your inspiratory muscle. 
So your transpulmonary pressure is around 25. But if you face a severe de novo respiratory failure or the same pressure that you set on the vent, the patient is very likely to perform a quite strong effort. Here I put to be very schematic, minus 20. And the transpulmonary pressure is obviously much higher than in mild and over respiratory failure. Well, this may, may develop to the well-known risk of uh, self-inflate lung injury. Let's see what is happening in animals. On the upper panel, left hand side, my lung injury and total respiratory support. On the right hand side, still my lung injury plus the patient is continuously breathing with the dent. You see a uh, few modification, but I would say not much uh, from the anatomopathological point of view. Severe lung injury, totally dependent on the ventilator. So the transponary pressure is the pressure more or less applied on the vent. Here you uh, ask the patient to breathe while he's mechanically ventilated and he has severe lung injury. Here is a mess, you can see. Here is the total destruction of the alveoli leading to uh, what the author claim is self-inflicted lung injury. So there is a quite simple way if you don't want to monitor transpulmonary pressure that requires the esophageal balloon. We published a study on the Blue Journal a few months ago in which we show that the more the patient is uh, uh, making a bigger effort during NIV and then over respiratory failure, the highest probability has to be intubated. But you may say, well, I don't have this balloon. Uh, I'm not very used to it. And you know, numbers come out for every machine, but you need to interpret the number. So a simple way is to see how big is the tidal volume that the patient is, uh, uh, is, uh, is doing. In this study, it has been shown that if you develop a tidal volume higher than nine ml pro kilo compared to patient that develop a lower tidal volume, you may increase the risk of NIV failure. Why this? Obviously, because you perform a lot of effort with your respiratory muscle and your transpulmonary pressure is higher and tidal volume is also higher. Because I remind to you that NIV cannot be, or only in extreme situation, a control mode of ventilation. It's an assist mode of ventilation. And therefore, the patient is uh, performing the tidal volume, dividing this tidal volume between what you set on the van and what the patient is doing with the effort. So check always that the patient is not generating a quite high tidal volume. So to make a long story short, should NIV be used in the novo acute respiratory failure according to guidelines? Specific risks has been described with NIV and there is not enough evidence to recommend its use. Obviously further research is needed, but considering that some study have identified population likely to succeed with NIV, a trial of this device may be offered to a patient with hypoxic respiratory failure, community acquiring pneumonia, early RDS, if and only if they are being managed by an experienced clinical team, carefully selected, closely monitored in the ICU or similar, and the assess especially early after starting NIV to avoid what Dorando Petro, the marathon man of Italy in the Olympic games did almost hundred years ago. Last, on a couple of slides, everything should be also mediated by a good monitor. And a good monitoring means also good ventilators. Well, we know that a good ventilator should have 
should have also good leaks compensation, good, uh, uh, good modes. But I think monitoring is probably the most important thing. There is only one study, to my knowledge, that we did a few years ago in COPD patients. What we did, we did a very simple thing in COPD exacerbation. We randomized the patient to receive uh, an IV based on what the operator was seeing only on the, with number on the digital screen of the vent, covering the screen with the black paper, or in the other group of randomized patients, we could observe the traces on the screen and not only read the number. Well, as you can see here in this slide, we didn't change the outcome of a patient in terms of intubation and the mortality, probably because the number of patients was not extremely high, but we observe a more rapid normalization of pH already at two hours and almost in the totality of patient in 24 hours. Here is more or less what we got uh, concerning pH here. Optimize ventilation based on the screen uh, diagram and on the screen traces and standard ventilation based only on numbers at the side of the screen. Well, this is what you can call a good ventilator and a good monitoring system. I think here the trays are clear. Uh, you can see uh, pressure, flow, and volume. Here you can see how hard is breathing the patient. Eventually, the patient has an asynchrony uh, based on the flow and on the uh, pressure trays. Uh, you have all sorts uh, of uh, um, numbers that come out from these trays. For example, the tidal volume expressed per kilogram, uh, the uh, calculated uh, tidal volume, the percentage of leak, even the dynamic uh, compliance, uh, and, and obviously also the mode of ventilation when you suck the patient, uh, the possibility of uh, nebulization. And also uh, you may come back to a different page of a screen to immediately realize how did you set uh, these, uh, the, uh, everything? How did you set the expiratory trigger, the rise time, uh, the flow triggering, the peep and so forth. So this is to say that uh, NIV success is strongly depend on the human factors, but also by the technical factor. So in conclusion, the new guidelines emphasize the role of NIV as first-line treatment for acute respiratory failure due to COPD exacerbation, obviously only in patients with a pH lower than 7.35, in patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema, even outside the hospital. New conditional recommendation for post-op respiratory failure, palliative care, chest trauma, prophylaxis of pox extubation failure in iris patients. No recommendation for viral pandemics, asthma, and then over respiratory failure, but we extensively dealt with pandemics and then over respiratory failure. Well, I want to conclude now, really. Well, probably you have noted that none of the members of the committee was a female. They were only male. Well, this was quite disturbing especially in this day. So I want to go back in the literature and see why this choice was done. This is a typical female brain. You see a lot of mess here, a lot of line, many neural connections grow from one side to the other, left to right, all the hemisphere. And scientists say this could account for women's better verbal skills and intuitive abilities. Well, strong statement. This is why I always hire female doctors in my unit. As what about men? I remind to you that in this task force, 
of the people were men. Let's see how the man breaks looks like. Easy, linear, most connection run between the front and back parts of the same brain atmosphere. And scientists said that this could account for the better spatial skills and motor muscle control in men. This is why women are scientists and men, even if they are old, they still play stupid games. Thank you very much. This is me and this is my dog, Ralph. And this is our captain. Please note the fantastic body of our captain. Thank you very much. I'm willing to uh, answer to your question. Stefano, um, thank you very much. That was as per normal uh, expected, right? Um, maybe the, the last um, two or three slides were the most important ones about the female brain and the male brain. Uh, anyway, I didn't know that you're into neurology, so we'll maybe ask some um, questions. We have about eight questions that we can run through and you can sort of... Um, I can, uh, if you want, I can uh, read the very quickly and I try... Oh, okay. To... You've got them in front as well, whatever, right? Whatever you like. And yeah, okay. you... Andrew is asking, how was the mental status of a palliative patient and were there at risk yep. of aspiration? Obviously, pay, all the patients at risk of aspiration were excluded uh, and every patient could, should be conscious to accept uh, the use of either NIV or can be also high flow nasal cannula as a palliative tool. Obviously, uh, this is a decision of a patient to be treated, uh, to relieve dyspnea. So these, the, all these studies were done in conscious patients. Um, another anonymous, uh, uh, when you say bi-level, are you included time low of one second or less like up IPRV? Uh, I, when I uh, use the term, well, not me, but people use bi-level, uh, they always refer to pressure support or pressure control. Uh, I will pressure release ventilation. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no study about the use of NIV, uh, randomized control trial, uh, in any kind of diseases. So we refer to pressure support and pressure control mainly. Some study PAV, uh, but uh, for sure, and some other NAVA, but the NAVA study were mainly uh, physiological studies. Another anonymous, why did you not use high flow therapy with palliative patients since high flow is so popular and less invasive? Uh, obviously it's what we are using, but at that time of a task force, uh, high flow nasal cannula was not as uh, popular, I would say. I'm sorry, my, my dog is barking and maybe you can hear my dog barking, sorry. Uh, so just to say that uh, there is only one study a physiological study about uh, uh, from Dr. Hui, from uh, uh, Dr. Hui is working in uh, um, Anderson in, uh, in um, Texas, I think. And he compare uh, NIV with high flow nasal cannula, physiological study of anar on dyspnea and the data were comparable. I agree with you. But the eye flow, at least in certain patients, is better uh, tolerate, but not always, because sometimes you need to really titrate quite well uh, the, the, the humidity, but more than humidity, the, the temperature. The temperature is critical to achieve a good uh, uh, tolerance from the patient. Another anonymous. Do you think that this study, the testubation to NIV and eye flow, are patient specific? Which groups are most beneficial of NIV? Well, I think, I think that uh, uh, there are two powerful tools that we may use. Uh, probably uh, it does need to be shown in randomized control tie, eye flow probably is better tolerate. But on the other side, I strongly believe, and I learned it even during the, the COVID-19 pandemics, when the game is getting tougher and tougher, uh, if you set well NIV, probably NIV is more effective. Uh, well, you may, if you know how to set probably the event. But once more, uh, we did, uh, we are doing 
uh, we finish actually a study in uh, COVID-19 patient uh, using transformer repression, the worst method to support the patient is CPAP because the patient are uh, developing quite high um, transformer repression. Uh, eye flow is not as effective as NIV in reducing the esophageal swing. So when the patient is quite sick, I rather try to reduce the work of briefing to further reduce transpulmonary pressure for uh, the same level of support. Uh, well, but these are uh, need to be uh, need to be published before. Um, Tom Petty, uh, Tom Petty, like the singer, no, is age. You got an age, so it's not Tom Petty, a VR breaker. Two questions regarding what is HOW? Oh, I don't understand. Oh, regarding the hour rather than, sorry, sorry. I thought it was an acronym, it was like double uh, World Health Organization, sorry. <laughs> Two questions regarding the how rather than the who of NIV. In your opinion, is the LMA interface better tolerated by the patient over a mask? One million dollar question, I cannot tell you. There is a subtle patient that definitely prefer the helmet, but others, they don't stand it for because of the noise, because of the claustrophobia, uh, and lack of humidification. You need also to face that it's very difficult to humidify the helmet. So I think that there is uh, the, the beauty of having more than one interface is that you can uh, eventually assess them and try to find out what is the best way to ventilate the specific patient or even rotate the strategy, apply sometimes uh, one interface and sometimes the others. Coming back once on this topic about high flow, I think that high flow may be used in the interval of NIV. Think about it. Uh, it's very unrealistically that the patient is ventilated 24 hours a day with a helmet or with a full face mask. So what do you do now? You remove the interface and you put the patient of oxygen. The oxygen does not do anything on respiratory mechanics. The eye flow does. Small amount of PEEP, CO2 clearance, uh, you, perfect humidify. So uh, I rather apply eye flow in NIV interval rather than using uh, standard oxygen. And this VLM interface, just a clinical effective face mask. Yes, there, is, uh, there are few studies that show that sun timing is even more effective than a face mask. Uh, but uh, once more, you need to set the vent according to specific setting. You cannot, in other words, ventilate it. Uh, the patient with the same pressure with a, a full face mask or total face mask and with the helmet. You need to increase at least uh, by 50% the inspiratory pressure, double the expiratory pressure and apply uh, the fastest uh, uh, initial flow rate or ramps. So it's, it's relatively more tricky. Uh, and then the monitoring is uh, an act of fate because obviously tidal volume is a number when you use the helmet. You don't know due to the dead space and so forth, which kind of, uh, uh, of tidal volume are you achieving? Uh, well, can acute exacerbation occur due to sepsis after prolonged NIV after successful weaning? <sighs> Sail Sinha. Uh, <laughs> yes, everything can occur in medicine. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think that sepsis is a major complication of NIV. Actually, it's the other way around. I don't see many, I, didn't, I don't recall many cases of sepsis. Can NIV used with low flow, high frequency oscillation be used in acute exacerbation? I don't know. Uh, high frequency oscillation has been quite popular until 10 years ago. Now the studies has been more negative than positive. So I have no experience. I try maybe two or three times in my life. So my mother is used to tell me, don't talk about things that you don't do it or don't use it. So high frequency, I cannot tell you much. Uh, Alam Akash, uh, 
If a patient affect, affected long-term by COVID-19 increases work, work, work or breathing, I think, what procedure is the best for this patient to early recover? NIV or high flow? Well, once more, there is no magic number. I think that uh, if a magic recipe, sorry, I think that if the patient is recruiting very much uh, uh, the uh, inspiratory muscle, uh, the neck muscle, I would go for uh, NIV. But once more, it's easy. If you have a vent or a device, that you can combine the two and you can even visually assess what is the response of the patient. If you have a good monitoring system, also on the screen, you can immediately uh, depict uh, what is the best uh, option for this particular patient. Uh, do you think the lung injury would occur if you use high repression release? Well, uh, theoretically, yes, but uh, as I said before, there are no study using high repression release and uh, um, NIV. Uh, Jitan, what is the indication for B-level dual CPA mode? No study, once more. I mean, you, you mean when you did B-level, you mean uh, is a, a brand name of a, of a specific ventilator, right? Uh, no study. Uh, I was curious once uh, in a while, I said, well, I need to study, but in literature, uh, no study about the use of bi-level. There is a lot of study in intubated patients, but not on NIV. Can transpulmonary pressure be useful in COVID-19? Well, it is, obviously it is, very important, I think, but as uh, I said before, we finished a study on 16 patients, uh, randomized to all these three devices, uh, high flow oxygen, uh, CPAP, and NIV to two different settings. Well, it's very demanding, and it's not easy even for the operator to, uh, first to convince patient to swallow a balloon, and second, for safety reason, it's not always easy, even if you are already vaccinated, uh, insert the balloon in uh, uh, infectious patient, I would say. Uh, bam, bam. Okay. Sorry, I try. Do you have a recommendation for using an NAV in IPF patient? Well, Selim Arkan, uh, you know that when you need uh, mechanical ventilation in IPF patient, this means that you are towards the end of your medical history. I and mean, all the study using NIV or invasive mechanical ventilation show that 90% of the people, they die when they need mechanical ventilation. So, I, my clinical experience tell me that when we use as palliative tool is better I flow nasal cannula rather than uh, NIV. Uh, it's more tolerated. Uh, it allowed patient to speak, uh, maybe the last word to their relatives, but I don't think is a life saving uh, procedure. Uh, non NIV, or high flow, but even intubation. That's extensively shown since we studied by AIS and coworker that at least 90% of these people were going to die if they really need mechanical ventilation, unfortunately. Unless, unless you are on a waiting list for lung transplantation and therefore intubation may be used as a, as a, um, as a bridge to transplantation. Let's see if there is any more question. No, I think that was the last question. If, is it right, Gran? Yeah, I think, I think you have covered it, Stefano. It's, it's good, everybody's um, good, okay. good, good, good questions and of course, good answers as well. So I think everybody should be more than satisfied. Look, again, on behalf of Aya, thank you very much. It's uh, well, always a pleasure. It really is. I think um, you, everybody's heard from the master himself, <laughs> and I, I'm sure that was your dog barking. But look, yes. thanks everybody for attending. We really appreciate it. My dog it. want to say hello. You know, yes. <laughs> I've been he was before. barking. He want to apologize why he was barking. <laughs>
He need a fact. <laughs> He's just yeah. on my feet, actually. Good. Good. Okay, everybody. So look, thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon at our next webinar. Thank you.